Okay, so once again let us begin with the recap. Okay, so we are talking about uh, convolutional codes. So we spoke about how to describe these codes and then how to decode them. Okay, so the codes themselves are not specified. Usually, you specify the encoder. Okay, so that's uh, that's with the with the shift register, right? Okay, and the decoder, the Viterbi decoder, works on the trellis. Okay, and then what else did we see? The last thing I was talking about was uh, yeah, recursive systematic encoders, convolutional encoders. Okay, so this can be abbreviated as RSC. Encoders. Okay, so. Uh, so, there are some notions here which show up again and again one of these notions is zero termination. Okay, so, once you do zero termination you can have uh, you can have several different ways of describing the same code. Okay, so, that is what gives you different encoders. Okay, you can have it as a uh, FIR filter kind of description or it could be an IAR filter and various other things are possible anything else also is possible. Okay, so, I gave you two examples, the canonical examples are important to understand, they are very typical and any other example also will be very similar to that. Okay. So, what are this example? This example is basically g of d being 1 plus d squared and 1 plus d plus d squared. Okay. So, this was this example and another uh, equivalent form for the same encoder was this 1 plus d squared by 1 plus d plus d squared 1. Okay, so am I right? Okay. They say that. Okay, so the choice of these uh, these connections, like I said, is is usually there's no big theory behind the choice for these connections, right? So you you do some you do a computation of this minimum distance, roughly, and then for a given memory, you optimize over all possibilities. Okay, so that's why. I do not know if this is the optimal or not, it might be the optimal for memory too, I am not sure, okay. Okay, but it is a very typical nice example. Okay. All right, so the main thing I was trying to convey was that the code when you do 0 termination with either g of d or g s of d is exactly the same thing, okay. you do not get two different codes. Okay. So, you have the same code except that the encoder is different, okay. here you have uh, you can call this if you like an FIR encoder okay, or uh, non recursive non systematic encoder okay this will be an iir encoder the picture will be slightly different okay you will have feedback right so there'll be feedback feedback in the shift register so this becomes rsc So, since the code is the same, if you are just using this code, if this if you are using just this convolutional code and you are not doing anything else fancy with it, you can pick either one and you would not lose much. Okay. In fact, the non-systematic part is not even a it is not even a problem in convolutional codes because Viterbi decoding algorithm anyway also picks up the message directly. Okay. So, you do not even have to do a inversion from the code word okay, which you might think it is needed in the non-systematic case, even that is not needed. So, it seems like a very straightforward thing to pick either one. So, you might want to go with the systematic encoder for some reason, okay. so it might be might be interesting for you for uh, might be required in your application that it needs to be systematic. So, then you have to pick the g s of t otherwise you can pick the same g of t and you do not really lose anything. Okay. So, that is the general idea from a code point of view. Okay. So, there is no, uh, no, no, no difference uh, as it is. Okay. But from a structural point of view, there are some differences okay. because of the mapping from mapping is different from message to code word. 
the same message may not give the same will, will not give the same code word in both these situations okay so there might be a message a low weight message okay i'll tell you why i'm interested in low weight message later on a low weight message usually gives you a low weight code word with the g of d okay so here you get low weight code word giving a low weight message here in gs of d that's not so clear okay for instance a weight one message always gives you a very long code word very long large weight code word with gs of t so that's what i was pointing out towards the end of uh, last class okay so showing how we can think of this as an iir filter okay so if you think of it as an infinite impulse response filter if you give it just one impulse you're technically getting a infinite length output okay so you your weight is going to be infinite in the code word okay of course we will terminate it at some point but theoretically it will be very very long okay so of course you can another thing to think about is if your block length is fixed as n if your impulse is coming at some n minus 2 or n minus 1 then obviously the weight will be low only okay so those things are always there okay so you can't whether it is this implementation or that implementation if your code word itself is designed that way it's going to be bad so so all those things will be there anyway both the codes are exactly the same so if you have a low weight code word here the same low weight code word will come there also okay right so there's no problem there okay so let me just uh, reiterate that uh, code idea okay so the code word which we called as v of t did we call it as v of d no i think what did i did i have a notation for it i don't know if i have a notation for it the code words in either case in one case it's going to be u of d times 1 plus d squared and u of d times 1 plus d plus d squared and the only constraint i will impose is u of d should have degree less than or equal to k minus 1 okay so that's the only constraint i enforce here here it's a little bit different i have to first have see i have to zero terminate right so which means i have to stop somewhere okay so if that is going to happen i cannot allow all guys here okay so i have to just say i'll only allow those us of d which are multiples of 1 plus d plus d squared and then degree is less than or equal to k plus 1 Okay, so k plus two minus one is what I would have written, but basically k plus one. Okay, so 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 it's it's very easy to come up with the the message sequence which will give you the same code word for both cases. Okay, so if I want this code word to be generated by this, I will simply set u s of d to be one plus d plus d squared times u of t. So nothing else will happen and the fact that uh, for any arbitrary us of d which is a multiple of 1 plus d plus d square you can also get back is also very clear us of d is a multiple of 1 plus d plus d square okay right so you know if you start on this side also you can go back to this okay how do i go back to that simply set u of d to be us of d divided by 1 plus d plus d square why can i do this division because it's already a multiple of 1 plus d plus plus it's kind of trivial there's nothing major in it but you can go either way so it's it's both of them are going to be identical sets okay there was a question about this i think towards the end of last class i wanted to answer that okay so 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 basically the codes are the same the encoders are different okay that's the main point here Okay. and the rsc encoder the recursive systematic convolution encoder has applications in turbo codes okay so it's it's interesting for us to look at that a little bit uh, more carefully and see if it has any interesting properties okay so that's the uh, that's the idea all right so so the key thing like i said what characterizes the performance of ldp oh, not ldp convolutional codes is clearly on the trellis you have to look for this minimum code words right minimum weight code words on the trellis okay so what is the minimum possible error that i can make on the trellis okay how what will be that okay how can i deviate from the all zero sequence and come back to it right in the non systematic non recursive encoder any weight one message right can give you that minimum code word right 
in the systematic recursive encoder a weight 1 message will not give you that minimum weight uh, departure okay so you need at least weight 2 or higher okay so so i mean it's it's easy to see what you have to put in to get the minimum weight code word in the systematic trellis right so this this equation is there you put u of d equals 1 you get the least uh, weight code word so u of d you multiply by 1 plus d plus d square so 1 multiplied by 1 plus d plus d square will give you that same thing so you do 1 plus d plus d square as your message you are going to get the least weight code word okay so there is really nothing major about this but just saying it is slightly different okay so something a little bit more interesting is weight 2 code words okay suppose I look at weight 2 messages okay so weight 1 messages message okay when I say message is u of d right weight 1 u of d what will happen to that it gives you low weight code word low weight in systematic in uh, in uh, non recursive and gives you high weight in in the RSC right. So, I mean these are all I mean roughly true of course, there is a weight 1 sequence which may, I mean there is no weight 1 sequence, but if you go if you push the weight 1 to the very end you will once again get a very low weight uh, code word even for the RSC also. So, I mean in, as a majority this is true okay many of the weight 1 code, weight 1 messages will give you low weight uh, code words in the non recursive thing, but only many of the weight 1 code words will give you very high weight code words in the recursive systematic encoder okay. So, that is definitely a true statement. So, this in, this in that idea this is true okay. What about weight 2? What happens to weight 2 uh, code words u of t? Okay, so, when I say low and high what I mean is with respect to the overall block length okay. So, here when I say low weight it will be a constant compared to the overall block length it would not depend on the overall block length at all. Here when I say high weight it will be roughly the overall block length by 2 okay, it will be a very large number. So, it will be increasing as a some constant multiple of that. When I have weight 2 u of d once again in the non recursive case I will get something low only it will not increase with the block length right it will be something which will be 2 times 5 or something it cannot be more than that okay. So, it will be some constant it will not increase if I increase block length okay right what will happen in the recursive systematic case. Depends on where you depends on where we give those weight 2 depends on the relative position of the 2 ones okay right course you are right there is no problem with that which is the which is worse for us which will give us very low weight things what that which divide okay so it should be a multiple of 1 plus d plus d square 1 plus d plus d square so I am looking for some d power i plus d power j which will be a multiple of 1 plus d plus d square okay in d power i plus d power j I can pull out d power i and basically I can look at 1 plus d power i d power i by itself is not going to divide anything okay so that's just you can throw it away so i'm only interested in 1 plus d power i will it be a multiple of 1 plus d plus d square okay, 1 plus d cube d power 3, three. Okay, or d power 6 or anything okay. so there are a subset of uh, uh, shifts or gaps or intervals between the two ones which will really give me a low weight code word okay in the recursive systematic code but many of them will not right so only 3 6 9 etc will give you one if, if the difference is just one or two you will not get a low weight code word you will get a high weight code word is that clear okay so that's the rough idea about weight 2 code words okay so here you always get low weight once again here you get high weight most of the times okay i'll simply say most i'll put the most within quotes well two thirds is most okay most of the time but of course, there are some points where you will get hurt okay. So, there are specific places you can be you can really let the devil pick the points for instance and then you will get a very low weight code word okay. So, 3 for instance is a particularly bad example here 
So, in general if that is some other polynomial if it is not 1 plus d plus d squared if it is some other polynomial uh, usually it will be a primitive polynomial ok. So, it will be some irreducible primitive polynomial if that is the case then what will happen if it has degree m and if it is a primitive polynomial what shift should is very bad 2 power m minus 1 is very bad ok. So, you know a primitive polynomial of degree m will always divide 1 plus d power 2 power m minus 1 ok. So, it will divide that ok. So, if I put my 1s with the interval of 2 power m minus 1 then I will get a low weight code word ok. Otherwise, I will get a high weight code word with weight 2 u of d ok. Is that fine? So, these are the differences between recursive systematic codes the systematic encoders and non recursive encoders which are exploited in the turbo code construction ok. So, weight 1 message is gives you high weight weight 2 message gives you high weight most of the time ok. There are only very few cases which you have to somehow kill and you can kill it in a kind of a pseudo random way and get advantage get, get advantage out of it ok. So, so you might wonder I mean is this the only way to get low weight code words ok. There might also be some very high weight message which will give you a low weight code word ok. So, it turns out this like this folk theorem kind of idea in uh, coding theory if you have a code for which you can easily find low weight code words ok then it is a bad code ok and you can find many of them very easily then it is a bad code. If you have to do a lot of work, work to find low weight code words then it is not a bad code it will be a good code ok. So, these are all not statements that you can rigorously prove but it is people have seen it in practice ok. If you have a code for which the low weight code words are easily accessible you can quickly find them then it is bad ok. If it is if you have to do a lot of work as in if you have to give a lot of messages carefully orchestrated to get a low weight code word then it is not bad ok. So, the reason is nature is not going to be so bad you know I mean it is all those crazy things do not happen often ok. So, it is not a bad thing ok. If, if but on the other hand if the low weight code words are plenty like every weight one message is giving you a low weight code word right which is very easy to find right. So, then the code is going to be bad as in when I say bad again you have to remember from a capacity approaching point of view it will be bad okay. in general the code will be ok ok it is not it is not going to be a bad code but the in for, for the purposes of approaching capacity it may not be that good ok that is the idea behind these kind of codes ok. So, so it seems like in the re recursive systematic convolutional code we have a reasonably good candidate right at least the weight 1 messages do not directly give you a low weight code word the weight 2s yeah they do if we can maybe kill that then you have to do a lot more work to find the low weight code words and since nature is going to be not so bad you are going to you are going to get closer to capacity with that ok. So, how do you kill these weight 2 messages giving you low weight code words is the main idea in the design of turbo codes ok. So, we will we'll see that uh, we will see that maybe soon enough but uh, before that there are other ingredients into the turbo code we will see that also but before that this is the this is the main idea in the in the design of the encoder in the turbo code ok. In the decoder you need other ideas which we will see soon enough, but at the encoder this is the crucial idea ok. Any questions, any thoughts? Anyway, I will have as many message bits which giving me low weight in this that many message bits same will give me the low weight code. Here also. So, yeah. overall, if I say take the probability of getting a low weight code word, it, it should be roughly the same. same. Yeah, I know. All that is true. <laughs> that is why I said it is a folk theorem, ok. <laughs> so, you cannot rigorously prove these things. It is just so that is how it works, you know. Here also, actually, it is not very bad to find the it is not very hard to find those messages which give you low weight code words. All you have to do is multiply by 1 plus d plus d square. It is not it is just weight 3 will give you all the bad things, ok. So, weight 3 you cannot do much about. But by the time you kill you reduce so basically overall what will happen when you do these things is the number of low weight code words will keep going down ok. I mean you have to do I mean I am not saying the recursive convolutional code itself is good I am not saying that you have to do some work to get rid of these more things ok. I will show you in the turbo code construction how that works ok. So, that is it is a much more fancy construction than this it is not just recursive convolution that itself will not work obviously clearly it will not work ok. You have to do more work. but again this is just a general principle you know I mean it should be difficult to find low weight code words in your code. If, if tomorrow you want to come up with a design of a fancy code which you want to claim is good or you want to hope that it is good it should be difficult to find low weight code words in that code. If it can be found just like that very easily 
then it's it's not going to be a good that's the that's kind of like a thumb rule you know, rule of thumb or whatever just, just take it take it with a pinch of salt that's all. okay so same thing is true with ldpc if you think about it right it's low density parity check code and the way you put your ones you're putting them randomly okay you don't allow too many columns to overlap right columns don't overlap then how many columns will you choose to add up to zero right it has to overlap you know and it has to overlap and it's not going to be very easy to find low weight code words okay so again a principle which is valid there and that seems to get you very close to capacity okay so similar principle can be used here okay but i should point out these principles are fairly new as in only like 10 15 years old okay so when the first time people proposed turbo codes and showed capacity achieving performance many, many people doubted the simulations they said so you made a mistake in your simulation <laughs> so it took a lot of time for people to come out of the uh, rigorous reed solomon kind of world into this semi rigorous world of uh, random code designs which kind of work oh, that's the idea okay so this is the part about the encoder i'm thinking if there's anything else that i'm missing out here which i should mention me think for a while uh okay maybe i should mention a couple of other things about convolutional codes before moving on to the to the bitwise map decoder for convolutional codes we saw the soft ml decoder for convolutional codes we didn't see the bitwise map decoder okay so we'll see that and that's an important ingredient in the turbo decoder okay so this idea the recursive convolutional encoder is an important ingre ingredient in the turbo encoder the decoder the bitwise map decoder is important okay so we'll see that soon enough but before that there are a few other things that i want to mention about uh, convolutional codes in as as it's used as is being used today so we should know these things because these things are used often okay so first thing is uh, puncturing and rate compatibility okay so usually when you design convolutional encoders you either design it for 1 by n rate or uh sometimes people design n minus 1 by n but it's not very common so i'll put that into bracket okay so 1 by n is the most commonly most typical design rate okay so nobody does anything different from 1 by n okay so the question is of course 1 by n is not the only rate you might want to use okay so n equals let's say let's say 3 okay 1/3 1/3 is a very popular rate to use so you may you may not want to use 1/3 all the time you might want half you might want Two thirds, etc. So, so the question is, why will you have something like that? The, the, the typical example is something like a wireless channel. Okay, so it turns out because of so many effects, the channel conditions don't remain constant in the wireless channel. Okay, even otherwise, in other situations, it may not be a constant over all time. Okay, so in your armory of codes, you should have different rate codes. You should have a rate one by third code, and then you should maybe have a rate half code. Okay, when will you use the rate one third code and rate half code? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So channel you need you need a lower rate when the channel quality is bad. Right? So you want to pick up that. When the channel becomes marginally better, you go to the half. Maybe it becomes even better, you go to two thirds. Okay, so two thirds is kind of where people stop with convolutional codes usually. Okay, so you don't want to go beyond beyond two. Thirds. Maybe three fourths, maybe four fifths sometimes. Okay, but rarely. But the performance drops quite drastically when you do that. So so usually it's one third, one half, two thirds. Okay, so then how do you how do you come up with those codes from A rate one third encoder. Okay, so you have to use puncturing. Okay, so 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 the typical way in which it's done is is the following. So you you have a mother code which is maybe a, a rate one third code. Okay, so here's an example once again. I mean, there's so many other ways of doing it. Okay, so when you do a rate one third, what's going to happen if you have k bits? U zero, U one, U k minus one. This is going to go through your mother code's encoder, and you're going to get uh, code words which are, uh, let's say, V one zero, V two zero, V three zero, okay, V V one one, V two one, V three one. so on right so this will be the code words so last thing you'll get is something okay so if you send all the bits that you get then you will have a rate 1/3 okay 
okay. Suppose I want a rate half, what can I do? Okay, you can do puncturing clearly, right? So you simply drop, let's say, the third parity bit. Okay, so you puncture here to get to get rate half. Okay, so that's 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 basically how it's done in practice. So you would have a rate one third code, and you would drop uh, drop one. 1 per 3 okay or you might say so so the question is which bit to drop right which bit to drop is the important question so you can't really find answers to those things very easily okay so what people do is just try all possibilities and pick the one that gives you the best performance with a ber versus snr plot okay that's one thing to do it can can be done all this has been done before okay like i said these codes are in the stand are in the standards so people have really simulated uh, Every possibility, and you you would know exactly. So these are this is called the puncturing pattern. Okay, the pattern with which you puncture is called the puncturing pattern, and that's available. Okay, so you might be even a little bit more fancy and say, in every six bits, I will drop two. Okay, and that gives me so many more possibilities to try. Okay? Maybe not these two. You can try so many others. Okay, so so how you puncture is one thing, but then how do you decode the punctured code? Remember, my original trellis is the one third trellis. I am suddenly I have dropped some bits, so how do I decode? Okay, so you have to assume something in the receiver. So what happens is what, what is typically done is if you let this goes through let us say BPSK and then you have noise adding and you get R, right. So suppose you punctured every third one, you will get a R10, R20. For R30, which has been punctured, you just put a blank and then you do a R11, R21, and then you put a blank, so on. What will you put in the blank? What is the safe thing to put in the blank? Or what is the only thing you can put in the blank? Yeah, equidistant from both symbols. What is that point which is equidistant from both symbols? 0, okay, right? BPSK is minus 1 plus 1, right? So this symbol was not this code this bit was not really transmitted so you have no idea whether it was plus one or minus one simply put zero as the received uh, value okay so once you put that you can compute all your branch metrics right once you compute all your branch metrics you can run your Vitabi algorithm and decode there's no problem okay so this is how it works uh, the, this is how the decoder works with puncturing okay right so if you want to find the optimal puncturing pattern right then what do you do you try all kinds of possibilities, run this decoder, and get different BER versus SNR plot, pick the one that gives you the best possible plot, right. So that's the program that you would have. Yeah, if this were systematic, one of these things will be message and the message you won't puncture, right. So you will puncture only the parity. Okay, so what about two thirds? What can we do for two thirds, Red two thirds? Some six out of something. Yeah, so you have to pick six, six at a time. Six. Look at six at a time, and then puncture. Four. 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 I have to send four. Two. Right? <laughs> two. To send three out of for every two message bits, I have to send only send only three. I'm sending six now, so you drop three. Okay, maybe two is not enough. So usually people don't stop at two. They go to actually four bits, so that you get twelve coded bits. Out of these twelve, you have to send only six. Okay, you drop some six, okay, and there is a puncturing pattern available for that. The standards itself, it will be there. Okay. So you pick that six and you send, and in the decoder, it's the exact same thing. Whatever is missing, you plug in a zero and you decode. Okay, so this is uh, this is quite common. Okay, so puncturing is a very commonly uh, commonly done thing in convolutional codes. Okay, so what is rate compatible now? This idea of using one mother code and generating several higher rate codes from it. It's supposed to be rate compatible, so you're making the codes, all these codes, rate compatible in some sense. It's some terminology. Uh, it's just used, so you can, you can get used to it. Whenever somebody says rate compatible, this is what they mean. It's one code from which all the other codes are derived in some easy way. Okay, that's the idea. Okay. Okay. So this is one idea, and this is very commonly used in most standards. Another idea is this notion of tail biting. Okay, 
it is an interesting name. Okay. So, so, one problem with these rate 1 by n convolutional codes is, okay, so if you have a rate 1 by n convolutional encoder, okay, when you encode k bits, the actual rate is what? It depends on the memory, right? So, let us say memory is mu, okay, the actual rate becomes k by what? n k plus n mu, right. So, it is actually, okay. so, so, for, so typical numbers if you choose, uh, so usually people pick mu equals 6, okay. so let us say we pick mu equals 6 and maybe n equals 3. Okay. So, what happens to this formula? It becomes k by 3 k plus plus what I am sorry, that will be an actual number no, 18. Am I right? Okay. So, if your k is something like 10 or 8 or something very low, then what happens to this rate? It becomes really, really low, much lower than your originally designed one third. Right? And that is not desirable, but you might ask why will k be 8 or 10? Okay, why do you want to use a convolutional code when k is 8 or 10? What do you think? Can there be any reason why you might want to use a convolutional code for very short messages? Not, not just 10, maybe 20, 30, something very short. Okay. For the GSM also, we will get. Yeah, actually, if you look at the standards, they will specify a lot of codes. Okay, they will not just specify one code for data communication or encoding voice or something else. They will keep specifying a lot of codes. The reason is before actual communication can take place, a lot of other signaling happens. So, something about okay, channel conditions have to be sent, some all kinds of signaling, okay, or some maybe some other control parameters that you want to exchange, various other signaling happens in your uh, in your cell phone, for instance. Okay. So, even for those kind of things, there might be some data which is very important. Okay. It will be something very small, it could be something like your some ID that your cell phone sends for figuring out the account, and that might need some protection. Okay. It will be very small, okay, maybe 10 bits, 20 bits, and that still needs protection because it is very important data. Okay. If you lose it, then something very seriously goes wrong. You, you are speaking and somebody else gets built, you know. So, something like that can happen. So, you want to avoid that. So, you want to encode that also. So, typically people will use a rate one third convolutional code for that. Okay. And you do not want to saddle your encoder with some mega LDPC code for that, you know. I mean, you want to use some simple encoder. So, you put a convolutional code. It is very standard to do that. So, there when you use it with a low k, you are going to get hit with this rate loss because of zero termination. Okay. So, this is rate loss because of zero termination okay so one of the smart ideas that have come up in the recent past maybe i don't know how old it is maybe maybe 10 15 years is this notion of tail biting termination okay so what do you do in a tail biting termination The only condition you impose in tail biting termination is you do not necessarily start in all 0 state. Okay. You do not start at the all 0 state. Okay. So, you start at some state such that such that you do something called tail biting. So, the tail should be the same as the head. Okay. You start at some state such that the ending state after all the message bits only okay, equals the starting state. That is the only condition. Okay. So, only condition that is imposed is ending state equals starting state. Okay. So, given a set of k bits, you have to figure out that initial state, which will also be the ending state after you have encoded those k bits, okay. right. So, for a feed forward encoder, it is almost trivial to do that. Okay. What will, what will, what do you have to start with in a feed forward encoder? Last two, uh, the, uh, yeah. so last, new last new bits. Right. So, after you shift in k bits, for the feed forward encoder, it is very obvious. Okay. The last mu bits will be the state. Okay. So, you take the last mu bits of your uh, 
of your of your message put that as the initial state but you have to do a bit reversal okay so it'll be like a reversal because of the way you're clocking it in that's the only thing once you do that your initial state will be equal to the final state okay is that okay so for the feed forward thing tail biting is very easy it turns out even for recursive systematic codes you can do tail biting okay so here you have to do a lot, little bit more work to figure out that state which will give you which will be the equal to the beginning and ending okay all right so that's the termination so here so you don't add additional bits after your message bits to get you to the same state as the starting state okay right right you you adjust so that for that particular message bit sequence your starting state equals the ending state okay but what is the catch here there is a catch receiver does not know that state okay so that's the catch okay so you can't uh, avoid that so right is that clear because the starting state and ending state in the state will be message dependent okay so the will be message dependent so the catch obviously is receiver does not know no oh, this uh, starting state starting state which is also the ending state okay right if somebody magically tells the receiver that this was the unknown state then you have no loss with zero termination Okay, you you have gotten away without doing any termination, without any loss in your decoder, but of course that cannot be done. Okay, that's cheating. So you don't know that. Okay, so what can you do? What is what is a possible strategy? We'll set all possibilities in the first state also. Uh, anyway, because of trellis, we'll get back because of the. Uh, okay. Last so the decoder is a little bit more complicated. Okay. So it turns out you have to do multiple rounds of Viterbi decoding. before you can be sure about uh, anything okay right so you you cannot stop with one round of viterbi decoding okay so i'm not going to describe the decoder in detail here there are some papers that have been written people have implemented this so receiver needs to do multiple rounds of viterbi decoding yeah whether it's hard decision or soft decision you have to do multiple rounds okay so you can't start at zero so you don't know where you have started you don't know where you are ending so it's it's complicated so all the so even at the zero stage all the branches will have metrics okay so at the zero stage in the proper zero termination only two branches will have metrics right so you you go very easily you start very easily okay but at the zero stage itself all the branches will have metrics so everything will have metrics so every state will be active and at the end you won't know which state to follow okay when you end also it's not that you're ending in one state okay in the previous case we were ending at zero so you were able to pick that path now you won't end at zero you will end at everything right every state will have one survivor path which one will you pick okay yeah so one choice for instance is to take the one with the minimum one and that may not be tail biting then what do you do So, right, so it's it's a complicated problem, right? So some research is needed. It's been done. Okay, people know how to do it, but you can't do optimal ML or anything. Okay, you can only do some approximate decoding. Okay, and also it will be, see this this will not work for large K. Okay, for large K you will really struggle. Why will it not work for large K? Anything you do will not work for large K, right? See, you can have a see if you look at if you allow any tail biting path. then the closest neighbors right can differ only in the zero stage and the k minus 1 stage right so you have you look at the all zero code word which is a valid tail biting path then you differ at the zero stage differ at the k minus 1 stage everywhere else you keep it at zero if i do that can i if i can still get a tail biting path if your trellis is like that then that's a closest neighbor and that will have a very short distance from it okay? and if your k particularly becomes very large this distance may not be enough so tail biting may not be a good idea when k becomes large okay and many way you don't need it when k becomes large right so only when k is small you can get away with this tail biting okay so you can do multiple rounds of viterbi decoding and you can do approximate soft ml 
okay, soft ML approximate is the key here you cannot do accurate soft ML that easily. Okay. So, you do approximate soft ML and this turns out to be good enough for low for small k it is okay. okay. I am not I know I am not describing the decoder in detail for you it is a little bit more complicated, but the idea involves something like that like what was suggested. So, you, you, you look at all the survivors and then look at the ones with minimal path see if it is tail biting if it is tail biting then you can declare that as the best, but then if it is not tail biting you carry your metrics to the initial state once again the same metric you retain to the initial state because you know it was tail biting right. So, you keep the same metric you kind of fold your trellis okay, and then keep on doing circular go round and round in this it is called the circular Viterbi algorithm by the way. Okay. So, you since you know that initial and final state was the same so you can close your trellis like that then you start at one point go around and then continue again. But then you need to once again see what happens. Okay, so what happens finally? Will you get a tail biting path, which is good? There are conditions for that. You can implement that. Okay, so you get a decoder. Okay, so a little bit complicated than Viterbi, but it can be done, and it's it's nice in the sense that you get a you get rid of the zero termination loss. So for small k, it's very very useful. Okay, for sending some small information, tail biting is quite useful. Okay. All right. So I. I I really do not have any more uh, details about uh, I do not want to give any more details about tail biting, but it is there in the standards most standards have tail biting convolutional codes they do not have uh, non tail biting ones. Okay. Another thing you will find in the standards is something called duo binary. Okay, I am going to only briefly mention what it is I have not I have not seen this very closely myself. So, I do not know why when there are some reasons for why they use it. So, here instead of each message bit being 1 bit it will be 2 bits that is all that is the idea. Okay. So, each, mes each message input uh, each uh, okay, ui is 2 bits that is the idea. Okay. So, it is like your d flip d flip flop is actually holding 2 bit outputs okay. 2 bits are coming in 2 bits are going out. And there are some constraints you can you cannot you cannot suddenly make the memory very large or something. So, your states will still be small. So, there is a way in which you can design it and for some reason this is considered good. So, you will see almost all standards use do a binary codes particularly in the in the turbo code or whatever. So, they use do a binary convolutional codes a lot and uh, maybe as a part of reading assignment somebody can look at why do a binary code is used. Okay. So, you can try and find out and come and educate all of us on why do binary codes are considered better than binary codes there is some reason for it I have read some reasons, but I have not seen it myself that closely. Okay. So, this is another thing that is always used with convolutional codes and uh, okay. so the one final thing that I want to mention with in the in this idea of convolutional codes is uh, concatenating convolutional and reed solomon codes okay so these were very very popular codes for quite a while okay so for a long time about maybe in the 80s or 70s maybe they were invented at that time for space applications even in other places this was very very popular okay so you, you concatenate a convolutional code and a reed solomon code okay i'll tell you why this was very popular and why it worked very well so, before that let us see a block diagram of how this would look. Okay. The outer code, so when you concatenate you put one code with the other. So, you will have an outer code and an inner code. Okay. So, the outer code is usually the Reed Solomon code and the inner code is a convolutional code. Okay. And then this goes through the channel modulation etcetera. Okay. So, the code words of the Reed Solomon code will be encoded using the convolutional encoder. Okay. So, that is how it works. Is it okay? You will have one message, you will have an original message here, this will become a code word, this will become my U, so to speak, then that becomes the code. Word. Is that fine? So, this is a very popular uh, kind of thing, and then you will have first what should you have decode first the you have to decode the convolutional code first because this is a no code so you run a viterbi okay out, out of that then you run maybe a pgz 
okay pgz is not really run it's what is usually run is something called the burley cam massey algorithm okay so that's what you would run for the reed solomon code okay so this will give you an m hat finally so this node uh, binary expanded equivalent or yeah yeah it has to be binary expanded so this will be binary expanded equivalent everything is binary expanded So the reason why this is a such a successful combination, okay, it's like I don't know. I was about to say something, but maybe, maybe uh, what can we say? Uh, it's like rice and sambar, for instance. You know, I mean, if you want a very vegetarian example, I actually thought of a non-vegetarian <laughs> example. <laughs> I didn't want to say it. Okay, so, so, so uh, uh, where are we? Okay. Why, why is this an interesting combination? Okay. So remember, a convolutional decoder is decode is runs on the trellis, right? You have a valid path, okay? So this Viterbi algorithm is trying to find a path in the trellis. So you have a legitimate path, okay, which is the actual path that was followed at the transmitter, and then there'll be a decoded path, okay? And we know that this is a soft ML decoder, okay? So if at all it makes errors, it will make errors at the closest neighbor. It's not going to go so far away, right? So usually, so suppose let's assume that we are operating at a SNR where if at all it makes an error, it's going to only go to the some closest neighbor. Okay, and how does how will the closest neighbor look for a convolutional code? Usually, it's going to look like this, right? So it's going to be a sequence, and then it's going to go back, and then it's going to stay. Okay, so any error you make is going to be a burst, a burst in your received word. Okay, so there'll be a starting position and an ending position, and all the errors will be confined within that burst. Right. Okay. Why is this good for a outer reed Solomon code? Because they treat as symbols and exactly. So if you have a burst of length, say B, okay, and if you have a RS code over, let's say, two fifty six, okay, GF two fifty six. Essentially, this will translate into a translate into a roughly B by eight symbol errors. Okay, and your Reed Solomon code will handsomely correct those errors. Okay. So if it were the, if the errors were to be random inside, then your Reed Solomon code may not really help you too much, but it might help still, but it won't be that effective. Okay. The reason why this combination is really good is the errors that the Viterbi gives out are suited very nicely for the Reed Solomon code. So you if all the bursts get uh, get uh, reduced to very few symbol errors then you can correct it very nicely okay so this is a this was a very popular combination for a long time okay till the ldpc turbo codes of course took over and even today when you use ldpc codes sometimes people use it as the inner code and put some bch code or reed solomon code outside okay and that is for a different reason not because the errors are matching or anything that's because when a ldpc code makes errors it will make very few bit errors usually if you design it well it will make very few bit errors maybe it's three errors four errors or something like that so you have an outer BCH code to clean up those few errors okay, whenever it, whenever it's possible. Okay, that's the reason why they do that. Here, it's it's more than one. There are many reasons. Of course, you want to clean up residual errors also, but more than that, the errors that the Viterbi is going to make is mostly aligned towards bursts. Okay, it's going to be bursty, and then both bursts can be very nicely handled by an outer Reed Solomon code. Okay, so this is. Uh, this is a popular combination. This was a popular combination. Now, now of course, the other things are uh, more interesting. Okay. Okay. So, anything else that I should mention about convolutional codes and recent standards? Anything else that you came across? Yes. I'm sorry. Yeah, the overall rate will be the code rate will be product of the two code rates. So this big because it's bursty, right? You can do away with a very small minimum distance with the outer code. It means the rate hit is not too much. So usually the outer code will be like a rate 0 0.95 or very very high rate code. 0 0.9 maybe very high rate code. Convolutional code might be rate half or something. So you don't really take that big a hit when you do that. But yeah, but rate is the problem. Rate will go down when you concatenate. 
So in general though concatenation has been shown not to be a bad idea okay, like this not like this but maybe something slightly different concatenation is usually a good idea there are, there are powerful other ways of concatenating it. So, so one of the greatest advantages of concatenation is what as you can see here at the decoder you do not have to decode the total code okay, you decode the inner code first and then you decode the outer code okay, right. So concatenation is a very very powerful idea even in turbo codes you will see concatenation is a powerful idea because the decoder you can have you can easily come up with suboptimal decoders okay, you decode the inner code first and then you decode the outer code basically it is not optimal right if you have the overall code and you can decode the overall code then that will be the most best thing you can do okay, but then that complexity is going to go become very high. So you decode something inner first and then outer manageable things becomes very popular. Yeah, that is another main reason why con concatenation is more popular. Okay, so we will stop here for this lecture.